Well, good afternoon, serious fans of Florida histories. Mr. O'Brien here with the unit review as we do the Seminole Wars, 1818 to 1858. Gentlemen, without question, one of the most costliest wars, speaking financially, that the United States, the young country, has ever faced. It was determined about 40 years ago that this was the most expensive war fought because if you compared the price of the three Seminole Wars versus America's involvement in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, the war against the Seminoles was actually more expensive than the Vietnam conflict of the 1960s and 70s. This particular painting is a fateful day in 1835, December, when uh, a gentleman from Virginia by the name of Major Francis Langhorn Dade is ambushed near Bushnell, out and outside of Ocala, and a very well coordinated attack by the Seminoles of Florida. Okay, let's get started. All right. So, it's interesting that when you use the term Seminole, remember that's really kind of a slang term. It may come from the Spanish, which means the wild ones or the renegade ones. It's not really a tribal name. If you're going to refer to the Seminoles, It'd be better to refer to them as the Creek or the Miccosukee in their language. And remember, we said that the Creeks were basically in Alabama, parts of New Orleans, Louisiana, that area up there, uh, Mississippi, the Panhandle of Florida. And there were the Upper Creeks and the Lower Creeks, the White Sticks and the Red Sticks, the Baton Rouge. Today, we're going to deal with the Lower Creek, the Miccosukee, and from this moment on, we'll simply call them the Seminoles. Now, we talked about the fact that Florida State University asked for permission all the way back in, I think, 1945, I've forgotten, from the tribes to use that name because they believe that it is a great name because the Seminoles never signed a surrender or peace treaty with the United States, the unconquered. And so we begin. All right, we did the opening song by John Anderson and the Seminoles. That was not too bad. And the Creeks migrate from Florida. <clears throat> you might remember that the original Native Americans of Florida, the Calusa, the Dequesta, the Eos, the Carib, all these guys, right? The Apalachee, they were pretty much wiped out by the Spanish in the 15th and 16th century. And what was left of the Native Americans who did not die of the smallpox disease introduced by the Spanish ended up in Cuba or even some of them ended up in the Bahamas. Well, fast forward a little bit, the Creek Band up there in Georgia and Alabama, seeing some pretty much occupied lands of north central Florida with some fantastic hunting and farming potential, moved in. And little by little, their way of life was going to be infringed upon by the expanding English and American colonies. And eventually, the Creeks decide they want to just get out of the way of the white man immigration that was happening in the eastern seaboard of, of uh, the United States, Florida and Georgia. So they pushed a little bit deeper into north central Florida, that area between Jacksonville and about Ocala, okay? And for a while there, there was peace among the tribes. Now, the Native American tribes themselves usually did not get along that famously. And that was to our advantage because if the Creeks and the other tribes ever got on the same page and they ever united under one leadership, they would have really changed the, the course of history of Florida and the Southeast. But the Native Americans never united in a gigantic league. Only on a couple of occasions did that happen, but not very frequently in Florida. All right. And there we have a map of the original Creek homelands, right? You can see here. Now, men, in this particular slide, that's where the Seminoles will be pushed during this, between the First and the Second Seminole War. They start here in North Florida. They're pushed all the way down to here with us during the Third Seminole War. And the migration, forced migration of the Trail of Tears by Andrew Jackson and his constituents are going to take the, the, the Seminoles that are willing to leave, 
right, the Indian Removal Act and be taken all the way up to places such as Oklahoma and Arkansas. That was a big journey. And that small group of probably less than 300 actual warriors, family members, and children are going to be here in this area here. This is going to be the primary one. Now, the first Seminole War was basically Andrew Jackson taking care of the Creeks up here in North Florida and taking care of a little place called the Negro Fort, which was kind of a neat thing where all these runaway slaves, some Spaniards, some tribes as far away as the Chickasaw and Choctaw, basically lived in harmony, and there were races of every, every color and creed living kind of as an independent rogue republic. But when Andrew Jackson and President Monroe found out that the British and others were giving weapons to the runaway slaves and the creeks up there, that's when Andrew Jackson came down and eliminated that problem. You might remember that was called the First Seminole War. And on the test, I will ask you this question. Why did the Seminoles call Andrew Jackson sharp knife? Because he hurt them so badly. They respected him and they feared him because they knew that Andrew Jackson was not a man of peace. All right. You might recall the Adams Onus Treaty of 1819 when basically we got Spain out of the out of the equation when Spain agreed to give up the Florida territories in exchange for the United States absorbing $5 million worth of lawsuits of Americans against the Spanish crown. So when you say $5 million, it wasn't $5 million in gold outright. It was kind of a legal settlement. And quite frankly, the Spanish are going to see a lot less actual hard gold coins in that exchange. But now Florida is part of the territories in 1819, okay? And you know, on March 3rd, uh, 1845, we became the 27th state in the Florida, on the American flag. And the population of Florida men was so small at that particular time that there probably was less than 45,000 people in the state. And that was including uh, the slaves that had run away and the, the Creek Indians. So it was a very, very small state. And it was still kind of a, of a frontier, kind of a wild, wild west, if you will. So Florida was very underdeveloped and underpopulated. And that's why the Creeks felt safe here. But the problems are going to start early, you know, as the population begins to get stronger and stronger. There was a problem, and that problem was the Allies. You see that during the American Revolutionary War, as you might remember from earlier lectures, Florida remained loyal to the Crown. The 14th and 15th Colony did not go with George Washington and the American Continental Army. They stayed faithful. And the Creeks are going to be, shall we say, cast aside by the United States because we didn't forget where their loyalties laid during the American Revolutionary War. So they got one strike against them already. There we go. And it's not a problem. It's not going to go away. Because ever since 1763, men, we're going to see that the Seminoles are going to welcome runaway slaves. Now, we talked about this in class. Remember, the slaves were not welcomed with open arms. They actually had to earn the right into the Seminole tribe. The first year or two, often they were slaves themselves to the Indians. And then little by little, as respect was earned, and they realized that these runaway slaves had value, they allowed them to intermarry with the tribe, was able to bear arms, was given plots of land to farm, were allowed to come on the hunt, and the black Seminoles became very ferocious in the defense of their new families against bounty hunters and other slavers and plantation owners. So yes, the, the blacks became a very big ally of the Creek and the Seminoles in Florida. All right, and there's that word again, Seminole, it may refer to the Spanish, and quite frankly, men, the Spanish couldn't control Florida. And sometimes I think they used the creek as a buffer between themselves and the colonies of the north. All right, and then we talked about the Black Seminoles. 
And uh, I had the fortunate pleasure of talking to some of the black Seminoles. And it's interesting. It is interesting how some of them have Seminole names and some of them still have slave names. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the uh, black Seminoles I was able to talk to many decades ago, uh, their surname was Johnson. And that's an English Scottish name that, uh, that was their slave name. So it would not be unfamiliar if you see Seminoles that have both biblical names, seminal names, and slave names. And we talked about how Andrew Jackson went into North Florida, basically wiped out everyone in his way, including the Spanish, the British, and the Creeks, and St. Mark's, Pensacola, and he really, really didn't have any evidence that the Spanish were arming the Seminoles, but he arrested them and basically bullied them too. In fact, Andrew Jackson was a big reason, his actions were a big reason in Florida why the Spanish were so eager to get rid of this liability called La Florida and give it to the Americans, and with it came the problem of the Indians. Now, men, we don't have enough time right now to talk about the entire story about Negro Fort, but you might remember that it was a rogue colony, if you will, and when Andrew Jackson went down there with a gunboat, he got lucky. He was probably going to have a struggle of guerrilla warfare like he's never seen before, but the gunship ship was able to luckily put a howitzer round into the ammunition bunker, if you will, the little place in the fort where they kept all the gunpowder and bullets and shot, and it was a hot round, it means it was heated, and it ignited the gunpowder and blew the fort to smithereens. So the old British abandoned fort, better known as Negro Fort, ended up causing about, oh, I don't know, I think there was at least 60 or 70 runaways and others have been killed. In fact, the death count was never confirmed. But the thing is this, men, it gave Andrew Jackson a reputation of an enforcer. The Americans have an enforcer who's not going to worry about the constitutional law and is going to make these problems, including the Spanish, the British, and the Creek, go away. That's not going to hurt Andrew Jackson's chances when he runs for President of the United States for what he did in New Orleans, and especially what he did in Florida. And there are some old captions from Negro Fort. I went up there as a young man and looked, checked it out. It was pretty cool. But what a story, man. A rogue colony in the middle of Florida, just doing their own thing. But unfortunately, migration and the United States kind of got in their way. All right. So the situation escalates, right? We now begin to realize that the Seminoles are raiding into Florida and are crossing back into Georgia and Alabama where we supposedly can't touch them. So President Monroe and later President Madison, they just want this to go away. They want it to go away. And the easiest way to do it is to take your regular troops, soldiers of fortune, members of the United States Army, and put a bounty on these Indians. And that's exactly what they will do. So, you know, Jackson went on the war path. And it's interesting here, men. And I'll ask you this on the examination. Jackson actually hired Creek Indians to attack other Creek Indians that arose from a different uh, association, a different... Uh, bloodline, but they were still part of the same nation. So yes, we had Indians fighting Indians for a price. We also talked about the difficulties of the American army fighting in the heat of Florida against a, an irregular guerrilla force Seminole army. And they were the masters of camouflage the creek. They were the masters of the battlefield. If the situation wasn't right, they attacked on a different day. If the sun wasn't right, they didn't attack. If it wasn't raining, sometimes they used the rain for their allies because they knew how bad the mud would hold down the American horses and, and, and cannons and uh, wagon trains. So fighting in Florida was very similar to fighting the Viet Cong in Vietnam. It was a subtropical nightmare where heat, mosquitoes, malaria, and exhaustion did as much harm as seminal bullets and arrows. Okay, 
And we talked about sharp knife. I think we're pretty good there. And so we get into now basically going to be very close to the Second Seminole War with the Treaty of Moultrie Creek. Now, Moultrie Creek is pretty close to just underneath St. Augustine, and it was an act of Congress hoping that the Seminoles, I'm going to start calling them Seminoles now, not Creek, would move out of North Florida here, and would go more into Central Florida here, between Lower Tampa and what is now Ocala. Here's Payne's Landing, and here's Moultrie Creek Treaty up here. Now, this is Chief Niamatha, right? And Niamatha basically was a realist. He began to realize that the, the territorial governor, William Duvall, was telling the truth. It was only a matter of time before the whites began to buck up against the nations. And quite frankly, the whites had the technology and the gunpowder. And why not save yourself the trouble and just move a little bit further south? Well, the problem is this, guys. At that time, there was a second Everglades near Tampa. And that Everglades was called the Green Everglades, or the Great Green Swamp, forgive me. And the hunting there was not as good. The corn, you couldn't grow corn there. The, the crops just didn't grow. Compared to where they were and where they wanted them to go, it was a step down. And Nehemiah and others are going to tell the Americans, you know, this is not a good deal. We're only doing to keep the peace. And then later it became very evident to the Seminoles that the whites were not operating in good faith, that the whites were using a lot of trickery to simply get what they wanted. And what they wanted was more land. You see, men, the problem is that unless Florida gets X amount of citizens, they can't go from being a territory to being a state. And a lot of whites are not going to move in this area with runaway slaves and the Creek Seminoles. All right. We talked about how tense the relationships were, but the Seminoles knew it was pragmatic to try to find a common ground and to give a little to keep the peace. Now, at least Governor Duvall was understanding and would have conversations with the Seminoles on an even playing field, but momentum is against the tribes. Because when Andrew Jackson becomes president, the days of being tolerant and the days of trying to work out on negotiations, that's going to go away. All right? And then Jackson, you know, becomes president. Wow. And one of the most controversial moves of all, the Indian Removal Act, trying to push every tribe across the Mississippi River to make, move, make room for manifest destiny the white Europeans and their way of life are taking over. The Supreme Court tried to strike this down. And Andrew Jackson was so strong that he told the Supreme Court, if you think you can do it, and you think I can get impeached because I got Congress in my pocket, you're wrong. And you know what? They, he, they were wrong. The Supreme Court could not enforce the constitutionality of the Indian Removal Act, and Congress went along. And a great number of the Seminoles decided to cut their losses, supposedly take aid from the Americans, X amount of dollars, X amount of corn, X amount of flour, X amount of whatever you need to stay alive, right? And when they got to Arkansas and Oklahoma, they realized that this was a horrible, rotten deal. But it was too late. And that small group of three or 400 Seminoles who did not go, the wild ones, will be the ones that the United States now has to remove from Florida. Okay? All right. By 1834, 3,800 Indians are forced off their land. And one of the dark, dark chapters of American history. Now, we talked about this guy named Osceola, and we really don't think he was a chief. We just think he was a warlord. His name was Billy Powell, probably born in Alabama. Uh, he may have been part Creek, Scottish, African American, and English. Yeah, he wasn't really a big man. Some people say he was about five six, five seven. They said he was effeminate. He said he kind of looked a little, a little effeminate, like he was. Uh, he looked a little bit like his mom. And but they knew one thing for sure: that this was a gentleman not to be messed with. 
In fact, his deeds and his daring and his military tactics become so incredible that he's going to earn a name very quickly. Remember, on the test, Osceola means the crier of the black drink. And that was one of their sacraments, better known as the green corn dance, where they drank this elixir, which was part of their religion. It was kind of like uh, an Easter confessional. And apparently when you drink this drink and you have an out-of-body experience, because I'm talking from hearsay, I have no, I have no experience of this. Uh, no white man, I believe, has ever seen the green corn dance. Uh, apparently, his they believe he was his prayers and his ability. He was some sort of warrior avatar, and he told everybody, "I don't care if you're Seminole, I don't care if you're black, I don't care if you're white. If you take our land, it will cost you your life." And there he is, there putting the dagger through a later treaty. Okay. And that later treaty, known as Payne's Landing, was basically the idea that all the Seminoles now don't have a bargain anymore. Forget about Moultrie Creek. You're going to Oklahoma. And if you don't, you're in big trouble. So Osceola said he told the chiefs, anybody who takes American money and goes to Oklahoma, don't worry about whether you like the farmland there or not because you won't live to see it. And so he did. He did. He started to go around and began to kill every Seminole chief, including Nehemiah, his buddy, who dealt with the whites and signed the treaty to go to Oklahoma. And wow, his reputation exploded. He was feared by the white settlers. He was feared by the Seminoles. He was feared by the U.S. Army because a small band, these rogues, were doing damage all up and down the peninsula. Men, they're going to attack white farmers. They're going to attack British, out, I mean, American outposts. They're going to attack uh, supply trains. They're going to set fire to, to uh, forts. I mean, it's terrorism. Okay? And one of the guys who's going to be in charge of the Indians in Florida is a guy, an ex-general by the name of Wiley Thompson. And Wiley Thompson actually captured Osceola, not knowing who he was, interrogated him handcuffed him and hurt him so bad that uh, he actually lost, Osceola lost the use of his wrist for several days. That's how tight the handcuffs were. Now, we know that Osceola's wife, Morning Dew, or Chico Kerr in the Mikaji language, was captured by Wally Thompson and sold into slavery. So we know that Osceola is going to settle the score one day with Wiley and the Americans. And so that's how they do it. You see, a series of forts are now being built, men, and this one here in Tampa is called Fort Brook. This is where Osceola is going to ambush Thompson and six of his buddies. They also know that the United States is sending an entire new company of troops into Florida under Major Francis Langhorn Dade, who is traveling from Tampa, Fort Brook, to Ocala, Fort King, because they believe that Ocala is the homeland of the Seminoles, and that's where all the trouble is. They never see this two-prong attack coming. Osceola and his buddies take care of Fort Brook and kill Wally Thompson, and Alligator and Jumper and other guys like Micanope will assault the Florida Division before they get to Fort King, a two-prong attack that literally is going to cripple the U.S. Army inside of Florida. And so they do. And oh my gosh, what a day that was. Because on December 28th, uh, I believe men, I was taught there was 103 soldiers. Later diaries are now showing there was 112. Apparently there were only three survivors of this beautiful ambush. And I don't mean beautiful in a way to be disrespectful to the American Army. I mean beautiful in the way that the, the Seminoles chose the weather, the time, the direction of the sun. They chose a clearing, right? They did everything right. And later, we will study these tactics and try to find out how to defeat the Seminoles because they are very, very good at what they do. And what they do is they're very good at guerrilla warfare. I am not questioning the bravery of the United States military. I'm just questioning the idea that we were not, shall we say, properly trained 
to fight an irregular war. And you know, a year after Major Dade was killed, uh, Dade County was named for him, and Dade County used to go all the way down to the Central Keys. All right, now, for Major Francis Langhorn Dade, his last stand, you know, he died in the first volley, and uh, the bones of the entire division, three survivors, two of them bled out, and one of them supposedly lived for a couple of days before he died. The story's a little sketchy, but we know it was a wipeout. Their bones are interned in this particular pyramid up there in St. Augustine, right next to San Marcos Fort. And it's right in the middle of a neighborhood, too. It's about 150, I'll take that back, it's about a quarter of a mile from the fort. And that's where the 4th Army was interned from that incredible day up in Ocala. And I told you about the idea that even, even the lighthouse, Cape Florida, was attacked by Chief Chiquica. His braves came all the way over from, uh, in canoes, all the way from Fort Myers, that area. They, they literally canoed all around the 10,000 islands, came up near Largo, came all the way up to, to Key Biscayne, attacked the lighthouse keeper there, John W. Thompson, no relationship to Wiley, and the, uh, the freed black man, Hank, and they burnt the lighthouse down, but the lighthouse did not topple, only the stairwell and poor Thompson and Hank were stuck on top, and Hank was killed, and Thompson was wounded several, several times, and later was rescued by uh, an American patrol boat, the USS Motto, M-O-T-T-O, and they flew a kite with a string up there, attached a rope, and was able to get Thompson out of there. He survived and wrote a diary about it, but the explosion was so big when uh, Thompson tried to commit suicide by throwing his gunpowder down in the flume of the lighthouse, that when it ignited, and ignited the whale oil, which is the ignition fluid for the light, the explosion was so big that it literally, they heard it 12 miles out at sea. Several Indians were killed. They abandoned it. They knew that they had done their job. They disabled the lighthouse, hoping that ships would hit the reefs, American military ships, where they could steal weapons and gunpowder of it. And then they went down to Indian Key to take care of another outpost a little bit later. Okay. And we saw that video there about the attack on the lighthouse. And then Chief Chiquica goes down. He's able to wipe out a supply depot on Indian Key that was full of a, it was a wreckers place. Wreckers were guys who made a living by basically stripping ships that hit the reefs. And this particular island belonged to a guy by the name of John Jacob Hausman. And Dr. Perrine, Perrine, Florida, the botanist, was brought out of Dade County and was actually living on the island when he was attacked. Unfortunately, Dr. Perrine, trying to rescue his scientific microscopes, came out of hiding, was killed by Chiquica's men. Chiquica's men took alcohol, gunpowder, weapons, everything they could, killed a lot of people on the island, and they left. So the terror was complete. Most whites living in Dade County went further. They hid in Key West. All right? And finally, you know, we talked about the idea that uh, the Americans could not bring Osceola in. They tried burning all the crops, destroying the cheekies, imprisoning the women and the families, killing all the deer and animals so they had nothing to eat. And poor Osceola, who's now suffering from malaria and starving, comes under a white flag to talk to General Jessup and General uh, Gonzalez and they arrest him under a white flag. And the American people went nuts. They did. Even Congress asked, how the heck can you bring a guy under a white flag? That's not American. And quite frankly, Hernandez and Gonzalez and Jessup and the rest of them said, we tried everything else. It was the only thing we could do. So you had a choice. Bring him in or allow him to continue the terrorism that he has been doing against us. To this day... We're rather embarrassed about that white flag incident. And then we're going to start seeing there's Fort King, right? This is basically where uh, the Dade Massacre happened. Uh, here's Tampa. Here's Fort Brooke. And all the Seminoles are up here, men. They're not down here yet. Now, men, look at this. You know, it's interesting. Some history books say that Osceola died in the prison in St. Augustine. And others say he died in... Uh, 
South Carolina. So we never quite figured this out. His grave is in South Carolina, but he was in prison. There's no question he was in prison in Fort Marion. That's the American name for uh, uh, San Marcos. Okay, there's the lighthouse back in the day. All right, there's Fort Dallas on the Miami River. They established that American fort. It's there and nobody even knows it's there, man. It's right, it's right, it's right on the Miami River. It's a forgotten building. I don't even think it's a museum. Uh, because they found out that the Seminoles were trading with the Cubans. So they had to cut off that trade from the island. And the Seminoles were getting gunpowder and, uh, and shot from the Cubans. Yeah. So there was actually a Seminole fort called Fort Dallas in the Miami River. Okay, we did the Dade Massacre. We did the White Flag. And then slowly but surely, men, there's going to be a third Seminole War. And that one's going to be in the present-day area of Lake Okeechobee. And there's George Catlin, who got permission to paint Osceola three days before his death in the St. Augustine prison. And then he died. And as I told you, he did die with his dagger in his hand. The American military knew he had no hope of survival. The malaria had, was really roughing him up. They let him put on his uniform. His wives came in. He had several wives. Gave him his hunting dagger, and he literally died with his dagger in his hand. Then the Third Seminole War, basically, men, we tried once again to buy off the Seminoles. Some of them went for it. Some of them ended up in the Bahamas and Cuba. And the last great battle would be the Battle of Lake Okeechobee, where, again, a small group of Seminoles embarrassed us, embarrassed General Taylor. And so, finally, we'd had enough. We'd had enough. So, in 1841, with President Tyler's blessings, we call it a victory. And we say there's only about 200 or so Indians left, maybe even less. 300 if you want to stretch it. You include all the young men, some of them 12, 11 years old. And so basically, they're in the Everglades. They can't hurt us. I'm declaring a victory. Well, President Tyler, that was a big mistake because the Seminoles came out and they fought again. They harassed people all the way up to Fort Lauderdale. And, you know, we're not going to ever get out of this clean. We're just going to get tired, occasionally send in little skirmish teams to try to find the Seminoles, and then we just finally stop fighting them. That's it. Men, it was an embarrassment when we brought in General William Harney. Harney was a great warrior against the tribes in Kansas and places like that. So he had a, a record of settling problems with the Indians on the, you know, in the, in the plains. They brought him down. And he's the one who built all these forts, what he thought would cut the Indians' ability to fight to minimal. Fort Lauderdale, right? Uh, um, all those places were built because of him. Fort Worth, right? Uh, Fort Dallas was already there. Men, the 17 forts were all put up with a great expense, and they didn't work. And so they couldn't just say, they couldn't fire them, so they, they, they brought them back to the plains. So once again, the Seminoles had embarrassed even the best of America's military. And General William Harney and the fortress system failed. It just failed. And now, as we close the lecture, we talked about the idea that the Seminoles, right, they had their own problems. Now, yes, I know they're, they're lucrative and they've made a lot of money and they're doing quite well from grants from the United States and apologies from us, right, even though they never signed a peace treaty. But the problem is this, and it needs further investigating, is that some Seminoles, some Miccosukee, believe that the younger generations have lost their heritage, you know, their oral traditions are kind of waning a little bit, and they are not really true Seminoles like their ancestors in, in the past, right? They become too Americanized. So this price of success is the loss of their culture. Now, men, that's just an observation. Uh, anthropologists and archaeologists have not really sat down and said that, but some of the older, older tribes members that I talked to in my younger days said that they felt like this type of success came at a cost, and that cost was their identity. And I'll close the lecture out by telling you that I'm very proud to be a graduate of the Florida State University, and I, the name Seminole, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored to be a part of that tribe, at least in spirit. Okay, guys, have a wonderful day. 
Always a pleasure to talk to you. I can't wait to see you guys soon. And hopefully see you back in the classroom. This is Obi signing off, saying...